to the Integrated Design Lab and to the Idaho Urban Research and Design Center at the University of Idaho. Um, we have a special guest today speaking. I'm really happy to see all the professionals here. We're also we're going to have 25 of our students as well. Um, this is Craig Curtis with the Miller Hole Partnership, and he is he's been with Miller Hole for 25 years. That would be I'm looking at him most of his adult life. <laughs> Um, doing great work, as you probably know, and he's going to share some really wonderful stuff with us. Um, he spent yesterday with some Hummel architects playing hooky, skiing, mm -hmm. and tells me he has a GPS app on his phone and did 8 million vertical feet in <laughs> four hours. Or maybe 32,000. 32,000. With Scott. Scott. Strubauer, yeah. yeah. Chased him down the mountain. <laughs> um, he's a WSU grad, but we'll forgive him for that. Um, and um, he's going to speak about the Bullet Foundation and a number of other integrated design projects. So welcome, Craig Chris. Okay, thanks, Sherry. Uh, this is a small enough group that when, once I get going, uh oh, this doesn't look good. Oh, there we go. Um, feel free to interrupt at any time. I think it's kind of a small group, and I'd love to have time at the end. In fact, Sherry, how much time do we have total? Our total. Okay. So we want to leave some time for questions. Oh, okay. Answers, so okay. Well, I'll try to rattle through this pretty quickly then, and so we have time to uh, answer some questions and so on. Um, and maybe I'll even abbreviate this this intro. I like starting with this though because um, this is um, some some verbiage that was written by Brian Carter from State University of New York, and it's the preface of our, our latest book by Princeton Architectural Press, and he wrote this in 2008 like right before the big crash, and it was just things were going crazy. And um, our book was about to, to go to the printer. And this is what he said about our work. He said, in a, in a setting where the virtual is increasingly shaping our lives and simulated environments provide backdrops that are becoming more influential by the day, the reality that is inherent in architecture can easily appear, appear to, be re, to remain hidden. In this context, the significance of earth and water, natural light, gravity, and materials can provide anchors in what seems to be a rapidly swirling tide flooded by ideas, images, fashion, and the apparently insatiable need for the new. The impact of this tide is perhaps most noticeable today in the rapidly built landscapes that are being created throughout Asia and the Gulf. However, it is also deeply embedded in the culture of modern architecture in the United States where the market economy continues to exert an overwhelming force. Through the development of its work, the Miller Hull Partnership is systematically engaged in a search for the real that establishes a welcome resistance. So that was kind of in, in, uh, in response to what was going on in Asia and Abu Dhabi and places like that. And there was, I mean, I saw some ridiculous buildings going up all over the place that was just like who could you know, do one, one move to out, outdo the last guy. Um, he goes on and says, using a limited palette of materials, the systems that Miller Hole devises to make those buildings, structure, servicing, and enclosures are all made clearly visible. In addition, the details of those assemblies are elegant, painstakingly detailed, and thoughtfully integrated. These characteristics highlight the resistance to many of the current practices that surround them. As a consequence, the architecture of Miller Hole contrasts sharply with much contemporary building in the United States where seemingly endless layers of drywall and suspended ceilings are used to conceal systems and wrap space in generic ways that blur reality and create a sense of anime. As the size and complexity of their commissions have increased over the years, Miller Hull continues to aggressively explore integrative design. That exchange has become more complex, however, as it is involved working with a more diverse group of people in the recognition of the particular contributions that can be made by those different participants. So what he is emphasizing here, I'd like to use that as kind of the basis of, of uh, what I'll talk about, the combination of the search for the real and that integrative design process, which has always been a hallmark of our work. So I'm going to start with a couple of government buildings. And for me personally, this first building was kind of a, a watershed moment in terms of integrated design. This is a project for Pierce County, and um, this, this piece of property is pretty amazing. You can see the size of it. The size of the property is equivalent to the size of Central Park. 
And that's what it looked like uh, when, when we took over the site. It was being used to, as a gravel quarry. It was in the last days of its gravel quarry uh, use. And now this is what it looks like today. It's been turned into a public golf course. This is going to be the site of the US Open in 2015, uh, which is incredible for a public course, especially a new one to be uh, included for the US Open. Our commission was to do a new office building up on the bluff for Pierce County. This is their sewer utility and solid waste utility. And um, this, the, the view that I showed you is pretty remarkable. So we wanted to take advantage of it. Um, unfortunately, that meant we, we oriented our building exactly the wrong way, that you never want to orient a building where you're facing west and east. But we could not, uh, we could not turn our back to that view. So we went for it. And then we had to figure out, OK, if we're going to deal with this move, then you know, what, what can we do architecturally to um, to alleviate that, that decision. So the, the, the diagram is pretty simple. It's a, a long building with a public end. There's a public piece of the building, which I'll talk about later. And then there's a core that divides that public part of the building from the office block. And within this private office block, this is where kind of all of the magic happened. And in terms of integrating, uh, in, integrated design, or what I guess what I would like to call it is more like just hi designing high performance buildings. In this case, it was conversations with a mechanical engineer that led to this concept. So talking with this mechanical engineer, we came up with this idea of these multiple solar chimneys that would provide uh, natural cooling for the space. It's a simple two-story office block. And each one of these office pods above the roof, we've got this, uh, the opportunity to include a solar chimney. As we got into it with the mechanical engineer, we realized that playing off of that idea, those are facing true south. So we turn, that's why if you look at this, you can see we turned these pods to face the sun so that as they protrude up above the roof, you can gather that sun and get that, that uh, convection process started. But we started realizing we can use these for a lot more things than just uh, convection, that we can use them for daylight, we can store energy on the concrete wall, uh, we've got the solar chimney. We can in include indoor vegetation that could be planted at the, sec at the first floor and actually extend up into the second floor. And they became this kind of floor plan organizer, creating these eddies of office space, which worked really well for dividing up the departments. And then finally, this is all of our structural shear. So this one move that came out of a mechanical engineer uh, providing input turned into the, be the organizing factor and the whole, really the concept for the building. So these are scattered throughout the main office block, and they, they bring light in. Uh, they really work in terms of providing natural cooling for the building, and things like that. So then beyond that, we had to deal with that uh, west and, and east exposure. On the west side, we decided that what we wanted to do is try to do as much as we possibly could with an overhang. So this is a government office building, so you can pretty much count on hit those, these guys punching the clock you know, they're in at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they are gone by 5 o'clock at night. This is not an architect's office. So um, we designed this overhang at 20 feet, and that seemed to be the, the, the distance out that we needed in order to keep the glare off of the first row of computers back from the circulation aisle through the majority of the year. So we kind of looked at it uh, um, through like the, the uh, spring and, and fall months and tried to hit uh, that magic time. And then beyond that, we just have to re simply rely on shades. At some point, that sun's going to drop low enough that you just have to deal with it with blinds. But we did the vast majority of the work with this 20-foot overhang. On the east side, where we didn't have the view, we said, let's go back to the old passive strategy of just planting trees. So we put this beautiful grove of trees that aligns with the structural system and brought those right up to the building. And so these provide that great shade all through the summer. And then they bring light in in the early morning in the winter, which doesn't really seem to affect the um, uh, performance of the building too much. We also included a, a shading system. You can sort of see it in here. There's a horizontal and vertical shading system that we put in there. And then in the, the public lobby, uh, the one story I want to tell, tell about this is the um, this is when LEED was just coming on, and the client was interested in LEED, but it was also something that was brand new. And this is one of these cases where we, even though the building would have surely qualified for some level of, of LEED certification, um, it had a lot going for it, probably 
could have hit, hit uh, at least silver, if not gold, easily. We said, don't do it. Don't pay for the certificate. Nobody is going to care about that. Instead, why don't you tell the public what you've just done and take that money and spend it on exhibits in the lobby. And so they did, and they filled this lobby with interpretive exhibits that tell the story of the building, how it was designed, why it makes sense um, for the taxpayers who have funded it because it saves them, saves them money. And it also tells the story of what they all do. They have an incredible recycling program and the people who run that program operate in this building and people didn't even know that. And now people come in to pay their utility bills, spend a little time in that lobby and they leave going, hmm, you know, these guys are really doing a pretty good job. And it's, it's improved their relationship with, uh, with their neighborhood and, the, and with the city tremendously. It's unbelievable to the point now where they, they're renting this building out for weddings all summer long. So, you know, this is, a, this is an office building for a sewer utility and they're having weddings in their lobby. Just thought that was uh, a great uh, sign of success. Another office building that we did not long after that uh, is one for Kitsap County. And in this case, really the big idea came from conversations with a landscape architect and civil engineer. And this site had a, had a slope of uh, 55 feet and grade change from one corner to the other. This is one block in a small town in Kitsap County, really steep. So a couple of the commissioners did not want to build on this site. We really had to convince them that this was a site that was, that was buildable. We saw an opportunity where they saw a problem. If we could terrace this building with very narrow floor plates, then everybody can have a chance to see that view. So we came up with this way of terracing these very simple, super narrow office blocks into the hillside with the solid offices back here, open office here, and then skylights uh, coming in. And uh, by adding these skylights, then you get, you get this very nice kind of uh, even light through here. Without this skylight and all of your light is on one wall, it would have been way too much contrast. So just that one simple move just really provided that great balance of light through the open, open office. So this is a real, real narrow scheme, you know, 60, 60 feet wide. You don't get, get an opportunity to do an office building that's only 60 feet wide very often. And um, by building it into the hillside, we're able to do that. The other thing that, uh, that we did by, by uh, terracing it in, um, we convinced them that they really had to go to a green roof, that there was no other real solution. You didn't want to look out across a gravel ballast or something like that. And the other reason for it was uh, the stormwater improvements on this site were going to be very expensive. And by putting in all of this green roof, we could hold the rainwater and use evapotranspiration to get rid of most of it so that by the time the water reached the storm system at the bottom of the site, um, we had no stormwater improvements at all. We didn't have to put any pipes in or anything. We just hooked up to, up to the system. So it's a combination of storing water in the roof. And then uh, this is a, the, the street was so, so steep we had to put a stair in instead of a sidewalk, was, which is really cool because all of the uh, excess water that comes off of the roof and through the cisterns, it pours out into a water feature that runs down here and then into the, into the garden. But we had these exit stairs that we, we had to put in. So underneath each one of these exit stairs, we, we created a cistern. So again, it was one of those things where we worked, it was integrated, that it was free space. We were going to have to build, we, we had to put these exit stairs in anyway. Why not just turn that into rain storage? So we have about 50,000 gallons of rain water storage that is just enough to get us through, through the summer. So those hold all the water and then in the, in the summer months, it, uh, whoops, it, um, it runs out and keeps the green roofs alive and then uh, the, the uh, overflow comes down to kind of a, a northwest garden on the north side of the site. A big lobby that organizes everything. And uh, so I'm gonna keep, keep moving here. Another uh, project in downtown Seattle, this one actually is more integrated through uh, conversations with our structural engineer. And this is a pretty interesting project. This is for Paul Allen and his development group called Vulcan. And they were doing a number of big projects in South Lake Union, downtown Seattle. And he wanted a place like a sales center to show off all of their projects. And the thing with this sales center though, is he said, I want, I want this building to be temporary. At some point, I'm going to move it. You know, he was kind of visualizing something you could, you could just pick up and move like a, 
with a big house, house mover. Turns out that the building was too big to be able to do that, so we started talking about building it into pieces, so each one of these modules could perhaps be moved. So that's what we ended up with, is a building that's built in segments. This was all prefabricated off-site, trucked in and put up, and the whole thing was, was completely finished out in about two months. So the way it's, it's put together is each one of these modules can be taken apart and then put on a truck and moved somewhere else. They're getting actually fairly close to looking for another location for this building now that he's built out, built out most of his property. This is, this is one of those modules. So they're, each one of these uh, steel bents, this is, a, this is doubled up, and what you would do is you just take a skill saw on the roof and run it right down that joint and take the building apart and then uh, move it and put it back together again. We did some things like uh, at, the, at the entrance, this is a ramp with a hinge so that they can move it to a site somewhere else, plop it down onto these sonotube footings, and then no matter what the slope is, you'll be able to get in to the building using that, that little ramp system. A very sustainable approach to landscaping and stormwater, lots of pervious pavement and things like that here too. And the South, South Lake Union trolley runs right by it. The South Lake Union trolley, otherwise known as the SLUT, that is the acronym. <laughs> Another project that we recently completed, um, the Northwest Maritime Center, and I think Aidan Dunning may have presented this project here uh, fairly recently. Some of you may have seen this. This is a project that took about 10 years to go start to finish, but definitely one of the highlights of my career. It was a blast uh, working in Port Townsend, one of the most beautiful towns in the world, I would say. And the location of this site is, is unbelievable. It's, it's right at the end of the historic street. So this is historic downtown Port Townsend. It's on the, the whole downtown is on the historic register. It's one of only two Victorian seaports in the United States. And at the end of that, it turns into the Maritime Heritage Corridor around uh, Port Hudson. This is where the Wooden Boat Festival is, and this is where the wooden boat building um, craft and tradition is still alive today, just as it was you know, 150 years ago. It's pretty incredible. And so our building was right at that knuckle, right at that intersection between these, these two areas. From the site, you can stand and see from Mount Baker to Mount Rainier and the Olympics, all on that one site. It's incredible. This is the site uh, before we, we took it over. It was an oil offloading dock, so the tankers would, would load in here, they pull in here, and there were pipes to come back, and they would uh, fill up these storage tanks with crude oil and various other types of oil, and then trucks would come in and haul it away. So the site was contaminated, had to be cleaned up. Um, then it was slated for a condominium development to come in, and the citizens from Port Townsend just went berserk and said, we do not want condos on this location. It's, you know, we're finally getting this, this property back. We want it to be community. And so they enacted a moratorium in the middle of the night, got sued by the developer and had to settle for all this money. And there were like seriously people like almost fighting in the street over this, this uh, piece of property. But finally the, the dust settled and the community came together and said, we want, uh, uh, essentially a, a waterfront community center for the, for the people of Port Townsend. So they had to raise money and that's why it took so long, but it was just a really fun process. This is the building today. You can see it at the, at the end of Water Street. It's actually two buildings. We broke it up into two for programmatic reasons and to kind of keep with the uh, scale of Port Townsend. This is a pretty big project for a small town. But I'll talk about a few sustainable strategies here that are totally different than than other projects. For one, we're building right on this shoreline, and we had to um, uh, we had to put in a bulkhead. And the latest technology now for doing bulkheads, instead of using riprap or concrete or anything like that, is uh, using logs. It's the most natural way to uh, deal with a with a bulkhead. So we imported a bunch of driftwood and drilled holes through those and put dead man anchors down 10 feet into the, into the ground and just anchored all of this old driftwood. And it just looks fantastic, it's beautiful. Um, another interesting thing about this project, it was done in phases and one of the first things we did was put in a new pier. And the old existing dock, if you remember from the, from the photo I showed you, 
there was, it looked kind of like this. There was a big platform out here where the tankers would come in. Well, there's an eelgrass bed that runs the full length of, um, of the waterfront with the exception of the big ferry dock and around the corner. And it's a ver very valuable uh, habitat for um, small fish trying to hide from the predators. And so it's anything with eelgrass in it is, is very high value in the, in the mind of the environmentalists. And so to put a new dock in here was going to be next to impossible because you can see what happened. This is based on a survey. Because of the shadows cast by this dock, there was no eelgrass under here. And so that's a really bad thing in terms of uh, providing uh, coverage for these, these bait fish. So we started right away working with uh, Battelle Industries and the Cor Corps of Engineers and U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife, DOE, and everybody we could think of that would have a stay in this, the tribes, and said, what can we do to replace this dock? Because it's a, it's a huge part of this next, this next project. They said, well, you know, this is what we've got now. You've got to figure out a way to get that eelgrass to grow back. So we came up with an idea of moving the pier out and providing just a walkway through there, um, a thin walkway to get through the eelgrass. So what most people thought would have been impossible to think about going further out into the bay, it actually turned out from the environmentalist mind, that was better. It turned out to be better too because then you're in deeper water so you can bring bigger ships in. So they bring uh, these huge three-masted schooners in for events and things. So it was a win-win situation. And we have reflective panels under the under the dock and grading along the side. So this is what it, what it was before, and this is what we have now. And so that eelgrass has, has grown back. And then it was all planted, uh, replanted using uh, school kids. All the school groups came together, and uh, the eelgrass was donated by Washington State Ferries, and Battelle Industries put in some money, and divers came and donated their time, and it was this big, like barn raising event, but it was planting eelgrass um, under, the, under the new dock. It's a very Port Townsend thing to do. And the only way we were able to achieve this is by having people in our office who knew how to use the software to be able to show using real science what the shadows uh, being cast for these different dock configurations were going to be. So we could, sh we could prove to them that um, by moving this dock out there and designing it in a certain way and then running through these cycles of uh, sunlight all year long and they studied you know all kinds of different configurations we were able to to show that um, this was a really smart thing to do by by pushing it out there and you know without the computer technology this was simple at, at, the, in, at this time it was really just using SketchUp uh, in, a, in a creative way we were able to convince them to go for it. So this dock went up in record time, uh, won lots of national awards for being the most ecological dock in the country at that time. This is what it looks like today. So the other thing we did is, uh, now that we had that dock, we said, oh, well, let's take advantage of it. We've got that pier out there and we've got water that is consistently 50 to 60 degrees, so we can use it in the warm months to cool the building and in the cold months, we can use it to heat the building using heat pump technology. So we put these big uh, convector plates out underneath the dock, and they're anchored down in, in between the pilings, so they're safe. They're protected from boat traffic and anchors, and they um, just use that temperature of the water. It's just pumped in a closed-loop system back into our mechanical room, and it's virtually free heating and cooling for the building. So there they are. What that allowed us to do is uh, really reduce our energy load on this building tremendously. So keep in mind, we started designing this thing in 2000. And by the time it was completed, you know, it was about a 10-year 10 10 year process, we ran our numbers and, and found that um, our effective EUI, we're, we're at about, uh, about 33, I think, is the EUI that we're, we're getting right now, getting some numbers back on how the building is performing. Um, energy use index, I hope most people are kind of familiar with that term, is really being used more and more as, as the metric as you're talking about energy for buildings. But because they're buying green power, um, and also we've got plans for a PV array that's going into the roof soon, that the effective EUI is cut down to about 18, which is incredibly low. So we're on track with this building to be, you know, in fact, way ahead of the 2030 challenge 
um, of trying to get to zero energy by, by 2030. So I feel really good about some early moves that we made all the way back in 2000 that uh, by the time we were done, we were still, you know, still tracking well below where we were supposed to be. There's a big boat shop in the, the education building. Uh, these clear stories that bring light in. This is the multi-purpose rooms up above with these big garage doors that can roll down and divide it up. So the education building on the right, the uh, gift shop and uh, cafe and meeting rooms and admin are in the building on the left. This building kind of makes the money and this is where they spend it on their programs. The best part of this site in terms of building area is right here. This is this beautiful uh, ground floor space. It's all given back to boats. That's a livery. So um, together with the, with the committee, everyone decided that the most important thing about this building is providing a place for people to have their rowing shells and their kayaks, and why not put those you know, in that location? It's pretty remarkable. There's Mount Baker in the background. And these clear stories are really working. You can see we've got a different, it's kind of a modern clear story. It's an old idea. You know, this is an old warehouse idea that we got from historic photographs of buildings that were nearby. But we extended the overhang on certain exposures uh, to perform better. So it's kind of combining old and new technology. It's the boat shop. And inside, finally a picture that a photographer took for us without the lights on. These guys, you know, they always, the first thing they do, they walk into a building, even if it's perfectly daylit, okay, turn all the lights on, and then, just, then they photograph it, and we get the photos back, and go, ah, kills us. These are those multi-purpose rooms upstairs. Um, these are just big glazed garage doors, so you can pull them up into multiple configurations and divide the space into multiple rooms or one great big room. Sometimes they loft sails on the floor with all the doors up, and other times they'll divide up into three different classrooms. Not a bad view. So I want to spend the majority of the time here talking about um, these two projects that we're really pushing the envelope on sustainability on. The first one is for the Bullet Foundation, and we're trying to meet the living building challenge on this, on this one using the uh, 2.0 version. It's, ch it's changed since we started the design process, so we have to meet these seven pedals. I think there are 20 now. Um, this project is up on Capitol Hill, 50,000 square foot office building. And the idea with this, it's um, really, it's sponsored by the, not sponsored, how do, I, how do I put it? It's not fully funded by the Bullet Foundation, but they're the, they're the instigator. It's a private uh, philanthropy, it's a nonprofit, and their goal here is by choosing a spec office building as, as the building that they wanted to prove this on, they, they want to show that the vast majority of the buildings that are being built in the world right now are buildings just like this. This is a typical kind of five over one office building like you see everywhere. And if this can be solved and, it can, and if it can be done for close to market rate, then this could kind of be a paradigm shift in how office buildings are done and make a big difference. So this whole thing is being done as not a one off, but being a way to show people how to do it and try to encourage other people to do it this way to make a bigger difference. So everything we're doing, we're weighing against kind of a typical developer building. We had to hit the FAR, floor area ratio for the site, um, all the zoning and everything. We had, to we had to think of this like we were doing this project for a typical developer, which made it incredibly challenging. <laughs> Um, just to put things in perspective, an average building over here, nobody does this anymore, but the EUI for an average building would be up around 70. Um, Seattle Energy Code is pretty aggressive, so just to meet Seattle Energy Code, we'd have an EUI of about 50. Uh, LEED Platinum, we'd be looking at about 32 for an office building in Seattle for an EUI, but we had to design to how much energy we could produce on the site in order to hit our net zero target. So. This is how much, no matter what we did, this is, we, f we figured out this was our maximum kilowatt hours that we can get on that site. So that had to be our budget. So that gave us an EUI of about 16. And that's what we're trying to hit. So about half of lead platinum, 50% well, better than lead platinum. Another way to look at it, we love this graphic that there's our PV array in order to hit a uh, typical building or, 
or even a Seattle Energy Code building, that's our PV array, like a football field. Uh, platinum, lead platinum building, we're you know, so far out of, out of our property lines, it's, it's ridiculous. So this is what we've got. We've got uh, that much area to deal with, and that's after getting exceptions from the uh, city council and the building department in order to take our PV array far out into the right of way around the building in order to get more area. So typical building, this is kind of how it's divided up in terms of energy use. And with our EUI of 16, our target is to cut that by about 75%. So we're left with, with uh, you know, this is our pie that we have to, to deal with. This big blue thing here, miscellaneous, that's the hardest one to deal with. That's occupant load. That's, that's plug loads, computers, coffee machines, coffee makers. If somebody comes in and plugs in a portable heater, we're dead, we'll never make it. So, I mean, this thing is so fine-tuned that we had to pay attention to every single load in the building, all the way down to the elevator, uh, the load of the elevator, and, um, well, we've got uh, foam flush toilets in this building. They're essentially composting toilets, six stories, and there's a little bit of power used for that foam flush, and we're even tracking that. The garage door openers, we're tracking power on those, too. It's kind of insane, uh, the amount of detail that we're getting into with tracking the energy use. But this is how it all divides up. You can start to see some of these things, you know, refrigerators in the offices and microwaves, dishwashers. I mean, obviously, everything's got to be Energy Star. But about half of these loads are going to be controlled by the occupants. So there are very strict leasing agreements that are being uh, written up for this building. If you move into this building, then you're, you're buying into changing your behavior as an occupant of the building. You, you're only given so much power, and so you have to figure out, you know, what can you do within your organization in order to meet the, meet the goal. We're also establishing an cap internal cap-and-trade system within the building. So say one tenant moves in and they realize halfway through the year, oh shit, you know, we're not meeting our energy go goal, we're gonna be over. They can start talking to the other tenants in the elevator, calling them up and saying, hey, can we trade you some power in order to try to get the whole building to, to fit? So it sounds kind of crazy, but it's, I think, going to be interesting. Seattle's the right market for it. You know, there are plenty of people who want to move in and be part of this. It's like living in an experiment. And it'll be really interesting to see how it works out. On the rainwater side, I never, you know, I tried to find this out today. How much rain falls annually in Boise? How many inches? 12? Okay, so about the same, same as L.A. You know, we're, we're way up there at 38, so we've got a lot of water to deal with on this site. Um, too much, in fact. So uh, net zero water is also one of the requirements, and so what that means is we have to collect every drop of rain that falls on our roof. We have to, we have to deal with it, and we have to collect it. So we're collecting all of that water. It goes through the PV array, falls on the roof, it ends up in a cistern, a 10,000 gallon cistern, and then that goes up through pumps. We, uh, we disinfect it and go through carbon filters and we can put it, right now we're, we're planning to put it into a potable water tank. And we would love to be able to just have all of the occupants in the building drink that rainwater, but right now that's illegal. So we can't do that yet, but um, this particular client is pretty persistent. Dennis Hayes is the owner and he's the, the founder of Earth Day, he's kind of, a, kind of a rock star in the environmental community. And his goal is to change the, the uh, not only state law, but federal law regarding drinking water, uh, uh, drinking rainwater. So we're, we're plumbing the building to do that, although when we move in, we won't be able to do it yet. It will still be drinking uh, chlorinated water from the city. But all of that water also can go to other things like uh, sinks and and showers, and we can use it sort of like you would a gray water system. Um, and then any excess water goes through and goes into our green roof, where we try to use the green roof for evapotranspiration. We're just trying to get rid of that water with certain types of plants. And then anything uh, excess of that goes out to, across the street to a park and into more in irrigating a park. So we're trying to do everything we possibly can to get rid of that water and, and have it not end up in the storm sewer. There are lots of combined storm sewers all throughout Seattle, so this is meant to be kind of an example of how to avoid overloading those sewers. 
On the black water side, as I mentioned, you know, that's totally separate. We've got an independent micro flush composting toilet system. This is what one of these big guys looks like. So we've got a bunch of those in the basement of the building and somebody has to go down every once in a while, turn that handle. And then once a month, someone comes in and they haul away the, the compost, which we're, we've been told is not really that smelly. And they, it's perfectly good for use and um, agricultural uses. And we've got somebody signed up already to take it. But I think this is the first time, at least in the US, of doing a building of this size with that type of, of system. Here's the, the green roof filtration is here, post treatment out here. So the shape of the building is pretty simple. It's five stories. We're kind of building out to the street for urban design reasons at the ground floor, concrete. There's a kind of a podium approach, typical kind of wood over, over concrete. And then we set the building back, mostly for daylighting reasons, but also it provided a, a place to put this green roof, which we needed for our grain water, gray water. So in terms of integrated design, working with our engineers, this is two years of design work with um, in just absolutely intense meetings with all of our engineers, mechanical, electrical, civil, landscape, um, a PV specialist from the East Coast. And um, I can't tell you how much money we've lost on this project. It's incredible. But we've, we've learned a ton, you know, really, um, we've learned a lot and we're hoping that we can le just leverage this into the, the next one and the next one, they just keep getting easier. Um, let's see, on the energy side, We've got a geo exchange system, 300 foot wells underneath the building. So, you know, that's pretty common. We're using that to heat and cool the building. Everything's radiant, everything's in the floor. The only, only duct work we have is just for ventilation, just to meet energy, energy codes and to bring fresh air into the building. So these uh, pipes that were under construction, as you can see, these go down about 300 feet. They're kind of daisy chained together. This, here's our rainwater cistern down in the basement. Composters are all going to sit right in this area. So construction's well underway. Should be done, uh, I think, late summer, fall. Um, I just came from the lab. Uh, Sherry kind of showed me around over there what you guys are doing. And I know that the students here are working with Ecotech right now, I believe, right? Is that one of the things you're studying? It's fantastic. We've got that now in house, and it was just you know two years ago we could not have done any of the stuff we're doing now. Now we're doing it all in house. We used to have to rely on it, all of our energy modeling being done by the mechanical engineer. We still need that. You still have to do the full blown dough to model or whatever it's called in order to you know pass the test at the end. But when you're working as a designer and you're making all these little moves. You can't wait for your mechanical engineer to run a new model every time you want to just try a different window height or you want to try a different percentage of glazing on a, on a wall. And we were doing these things like every week we were looking at a dozen different iterations on this building in order to fine tune it. And the only way to do it is using Ecotech. So this shows you just a, just a sampling of the hundreds of different models that, that we ran in house. This is kind of a typical the typical output we would get. So what you're looking at is a floor plan of the building. The upper floors are kind of defined here by this shape. The lower floor extends out. But within that office space, we were trying to drive daylight deep into the building. It's a pretty fat building uh, compared to what, you know, it's not 60 feet. We're more like closer to 90. So to get daylight deep into here has been really a challenge. And the only way to do it is, is uh, using this computer technology. So one thing that we realized right away that by, by maxing out the FAR, uh, which you have to do to make this a developer type building, that we ended up with an 11 foot six floor to floor height, which is not that unusual for an office building. That's pretty standard for an office building. But the daylighting hit below 2%, uh, there was a lot of floor area. If we got to 14.2, that seemed to be about the magic number. Then all of a sudden we're bringing our daylight deep enough into the, into the building that this is our core, so we don't really need it here. We felt like we could make that work. So we had to go back to city council and say, we want a height departure for this building. We want to, we want to go higher, but we're not going higher because we want another floor. We don't want more floor area. We just want higher floor to floor, and here's why. And the city of Seattle was, was pretty cool. They said, you know, we're going to not only do this for you, but we're going to enact a living building ordinance for the city and then try to encourage 
10 other people to do the same thing. And so now there's this ordinance in the, in the uh, Seattle uh, building code that, is, um, that allows things like this to happen. And I think this is where codes are starting to go where they need to go. So the codes are more performance based. Like right now energy codes are, but you don't see land use codes performance based at all. It's based on arbitrary decisions about height based on kind of past history. And if we start heading in this, in this direction, then we're going to really make a difference. So we're pretty excited about this, uh, this, this real high floor to floor uh, space. And I think it's going to be a great example for what can be done for other people. I wanted to throw a few of these in here too. These were just hand sketches done by our uh, project designer, Brian Court. These are some of the things we were looking at um, in order to get daylight in. We've got a pretty interesting heavy timber structural system that was chosen for a number of reasons. One, it's a renewable resource, wood. The embodied energy is really low, but also we could frame it in a way that we could bring fairly shallow members in to uh, columns at the perimeter and avoid any kind of um, header up here. We could bring our head, window head right to the bottom of the decking. This is old warehouse technology. These are going to be two by sixes on end, like you'd see in, in old downtown, like turn of the century uh, um, warehouses. You don't see it anymore, but we're gonna do it again. It's like two by sixes, just straight across. With that, we can span about 12 or 13 feet with those two by sixes, and then take our window head right up there. And this is one of those things that we modeled in Ecotech over and over again and proved that it was totally worth it. Of course, every time we did something like this, we had a contractor and developer breathing down our neck on how much is that gonna cost me? But this turned out to be a pr pretty economical solution. This was done by the Integrated Design Lab up in Seattle. Thanks, you guys. And they uh, took our Revit model, dropped it into, I think it's a program called Radiance. I don't know if Kevin is here. I think that's the the software that, uh, that they were using. And you can see that um, it just kind of shows what it's going to look like in a pretty close reality. A couple of lessons learned. This is a meeting room down on the first floor that we were looking at, and we really felt like we had to put a skylight in this room, which was going to cost money. It was going to take up some of that green roof that we needed for storm water. So it was a difficult decision to make. But intuitively, we thought this is so deep this meeting room that without it, without the skylight, it's not going to work. So we built another model, uh, took this to the integrated design lab, and we tried it with 100% glazing, 50% glazing, and, and no glazing. And what we found out was that there was really not that much difference between this and this. And in fact, really what we were con more concerned about was the was like over daylighting this and providing too much contrast between the two. So you can see the, the high contrast in this area versus maybe a little less daylight, but it's kind of e more evenly distributed. So we were able to justify removing the skylight in this case, saving the money, putting that back into green space. And again, it was you know, using technology. And then finally, the last lesson on daylighting, I'll show you, this is the upper floor, top floor of the building. Remember, we've got this huge solar hat on the building, this PV canopy that's black, black velvet. It's the highest efficiency solar panels on the market. Um, and no sunlight is going to penetrate through those solar panels at all. So we've got this huge shadow cast on, on that top floor. The top floor, that's Dennis Hayes' office. You know, this is where the Bullet Foundation is going to be. And there's one, one place in the building we could not hit the daylight. It was that top floor. It's like, oh, great. Now we've got daylight perfectly everywhere else except in, in Dennis's office. So we had to start talking about skylights. The problem with putting skylights in is, you know, we needed every single watt that we could get out of that array. Every time you cut a hole in that array, it was killing us. So we came up with a skylight system that is uh, based on these coffers. So each skylight is exactly the size of a PV panel. So we could remove surgically remove six PV panels, put in skylights in their place, and then fan out these big coffers into the, into the office space below. So that's what we did. This is what it looked like. This is integrated design lab again, without the skylights and with the skylights. And then here's what it looks like after adding those. So it was a tremendous difference. And Dennis will be very happy. 
So just, this is just kind of a reminder that the net zero energy we're hitting is based on an annual budget. We're definitely producing more energy in the summer than in the winter months, so that's how it balances out. In Boise, you guys get about 300 days of sunshine a year, I think, and it's, we're exactly the opposite in Seattle. We have 300 days of gray. So if we can hit it in Seattle, you can definitely do it here in Boise. The last uh, tool I want to talk about is a tool called Grasshopper, and maybe some of the students have heard of this. This is an add-on to Rhino. Uh, if people are using Rhino, um, this is all kind of Greek to me, but we've got uh, some really talented staff that, that know how to use this stuff. It's a parament parametric modeling tool, and what you do is you build, you build this, um, this tool, and each one of these, each one of these little batteries you can turn the dial on and each one of those relates to a different attribute in whatever you're building. In this case we wanted to be able to quickly look at different ways to arrange our PV array and quickly be able to see what kind of output we were getting from that. Again this is one of those things if we had to wait for our mechanical engineer to run numbers on this every time or electrical engineer in this case there's no way it would have worked. So now we have all of these tools in-house and the other thing is, when you've got a, a building like this and you've got a room full of, of absolute experts at doing integrated sustainable design, everybody knows the right way to do this PV array. Let me guarantee that. Everyone at the table is like, no, no, no. You've got to do it this way. And so this was a way we could satisfy them. So we built um, each one of these panels is tied to one of these dials. And we could do things like change out from from the Sanyo panel to the Sun Power panel. We could look at bifacial versus the black velvet. We could look at um, exposure. At one time, you know, we were looking at an atrium scheme, and so we had PV panels on the south roof, on the north roof, uh, vertical south array, southeast array. We were looking at just dozens of different iterations of this. And so we could do that and then tie uh, the efficiency of the panel, the orientation, the tilt of the panel, and where we're building the building, all of that stuff into this formula, and then start running different iterations, and it would kick out how many kilowatt hours per, per year. So, I mean, this makes it look like we did this pretty quickly, but this is over several months of people saying, I think I've got a better idea, and then you run it and, and prove it out. But we looked at tilting the panels, we looked at running you know, panels down partially on the southwest side, combination of tilting, different, different uh, pitches of the roof. This is all based on an atrium scheme, which we took all the way through design, proved that we could make it work, and then the numbers came back from the contractor, too expensive to build, scrap it, start over. So that was like the first almost year of work. We just had to scrap and start over. Um, so we looked at just dozens and dozens of, of ways to do it. At one time, this was the um, kind of the icon of the project. This is a south-facing array, and we really needed this. This was our factor of safety. Due south, it's the one place where we could really pick up a little more PV and really give us a shot at hitting that, uh, that one-year goal of net zero energy. And what am I doing here? 619. I'll, I'll speed it up a little. Unfortunately, that was very expensive to build. We were told, can't do it. And so we've had to just absolutely max out uh, the array at the, at the roof. And so we have essentially just a big, um, a big solar cap mortar board on top of the building that's doing all of our energy generation. Last project I'll show you real quickly is um, south end of I-5. This is the busiest border crossing in the world, San Ysidro, San Diego into Mexico. 100,000 people a day cross through this border, 40,000 cars, 10,000 vehicles, two-hour wait. It's pretty much crazy. We were awarded this project about two years ago. Uh, by far the biggest thing we've done, this is about $470 million worth of construction divided up into three phases. And we're, the first phase is under construction right now. But the thing that's been really inter interesting is I started design on this as I was working on Bullet, about halfway into Bullet, and it was just so easy to just immediately start thinking about going to net zero energy. And the client, in this case GSA, they, uh, they embraced it. So we're pushing this thing as hard as we can. And our goal is at the end of the third phase that we would have the first 
365 net zero project in GSA's portfolio nationwide. So it's pretty cool. And I don't think we could have done it without the experience of, of, of Bullet. But essentially what we're doing is taking their existing condition where everything's jammed in here, north and south, and spreading it out. We have, this is the uh, site right now. This is the backup into Mexico. Uh, and then southbound traffic is right here. You can see how well they, they uh, check pe people going southbound. Nobody waiting here. When I went down there to interview for the project, I walked into Mexico. And you just walk through a turnstile, and you're just standing there. There's nobody there to even check your passport or driver's license. There's somebody, hey, you want a cab downtown? That's it. Coming into the US, it's just a little different. Pretty fun project, though. This is uh, 40 acres. We're pretty much touching everything, rebuilding everything, and doing it all right on top of their existing operation. And they, we can't close down virtually anything. They have 24 lanes right now we can close. Um, eight lanes at a time for a short period of time on traffic, but everything else has to be kept open. So we're literally tearing this thing down and rebuilding on top of their existing facility. It's pretty crazy. All of our circulation we're trying to either put down into, into tunnels or into bridges between buildings so that we're trying to free up some of that congestion. So it's a really clean circulation diagram, this donut plan that circulates between these two buildings over these bridges. And these are what these bridges that connect the auto building from the ped building. This is I, three lanes of I-5 right in between these buildings shooting through there. And that's, uh, this is all covered with bifacial PV. So this is part of our net zero strategy. Is, um, this is one of those cases where, you know, we're, uh, we're the only way to sell this to GSA, they will not accept anything that doesn't make sense and pay for itself. So we had to prove that we needed shade on the west facing glass so we had to put something over the space in order to provide shade uh, into that circulation, into this curtain wall. So since we're putting shade up there, why not bifacial PV? Because you're already paying for shade. So we could show that the, dif the differential in cost between bifacial PV and some other shading device was negligible. And then you get all of the energy benefit out of it. So this was a quick payback. This is the pedestrian building huge volume of space into the pedestrian hall, all covered with uh, ETFE. It's the material that was on the Beijing swim uh, stadium, if anyone's familiar with that. It's a great material, super light. It's like, it lets light through in the quality of cow wall, but it's really light, it's inflatable, it's just giant pillows. So we're trying to hit an EUI in this case of, of 37, and that's because they've got so much um, so much sun down there, we can use it for solar hot water. And then um, finally using PV at the very end to get down to zero. We've got lots of available land area for PV. On the water side, again, going with geo exchange with a huge cistern in this case, like 200,000 gallons. And then a black water system, we're putting in this project is large enough, we're putting in our own sewage treatment plant just to serve this project. So we've got a biomembrane reactor from from Germany going in, and the combination of that black water and the cistern, those two things working together, it's just like magic. We're able to really dial down our water and save, uh, you can see the figure, 28 million gallons of, of water a year. And in San Diego, water is at a real premium. So we're as excited about the water savings as we are about energy in this case. So this one's under construction right now. Some shots of it, the first phase. The design of the canopy was really interesting. Uh, the primary canopy where you come in, this is where you get inspected with your car if you're coming north into the US. And they really wanted a view um, from the head house, port director's office, into what's called pre-primary. You may not know this, but if you're driving into the US from Canada or uh, Mexico, they pretty much know everything about you by the time you even get to the booth. You know, they're, they've photographed your license plate, they've checked you out. Uh, They've got dogs out here sniffing around and things like that. So a lot of their work happens before you even get there. So that view is really critical. And we looked at all kinds of different schemes in order to keep that structure super thin, uh, working with MKA engineers out of Seattle. And the thing we came up with that it would work best is a cable supported structure. So we could reduce the span by a third by having these cables off of these high masts. And we could also provide all of our pre-primary lighting off of these masts. So the total structure, this is about 750 feet long, and it's 24 inches deep at the deepest member. 
So it's incredibly thin, really efficient. And we, we talk about high performance buildings. It's not just energy and water. We save tons of steel on this by really dialing in the structure and working with a good engineer. So even when you factor in the weight of these masts, this structure is considerably lighter than any other system we looked at. Um, and we have fewer columns, so that means more booths. So the Customs and Border Protection people loved it because it was really functional for them. So phase one is going to be 24 lanes. Each one of these lanes will have two booths. At the end of phase three, when I-5, we're gonna move I-5 about a quarter of a mile to the west as part of the project. Then we get up to 34 lanes, each with two booths. So, I mean, that's a lot of traffic coming into the US every day. And we've master planned the site so that in the future we can get up to 42 lanes that someday that will likely happen. It's kind of a crazy amount of cars. We build physical models of everything still too. This has been very helpful. This was extremely helpful working with our structural engineer, looking at different configurations for the cables. It's a very complicated site. The geometry is weird. The whole site tilts at about 0.2%, which you wouldn't think was much, but the number of calculations they had to run on the structure was crazy. In fact, the guy who is our chief engineer on this um, at one point told us that um, he has run more calculations on this structure than any other structure in his career except one, and that was the Barge Dubai, the tallest building in the world. I thought, oh, okay, that's not bad. And all had to be figured out on a, a way to sequence the construction too, keeping in mind that this is all built on top of what's there. So we had to come up with a way to prefabricate these things in pieces and move them in like three lanes at a time. We're still working through all this with the contractor right now. The secondary canopy is interesting too. This is where you don't wanna go. If you go through primary and they say, pull in underneath that big canopy, then you're, you're in trouble. But this is, uh, the real estate's at a premium. So we had to really figure out how to get the most number of cars in there. And the cars had to be angle parking. They don't want people pulling in 90 degrees because too many accidents happen. So this is a very, uh, this is a, requirement that they just would not budge on. So we had angled parking, but we wanted the structure to be orthogonal to the building. So how do you do that? Well, we came up with this idea of these twisted columns. These are these big, big box girders that span over these twisted columns. Each one of these columns is five trucks of concrete just in, in one column. But we started at that angle and then they slowly twist up and then meet the orthogonal geometry of these box girders. Here's the structure, it's all on piling box girders get put in and then slowly they build out these uh, trusses these are all you know the actually actually the influence for these uh, trusses in the middle these tricord trusses where if you've ever i'm sure you have you you know drive out through agricultural land and you see those beautiful sprinkler pipes that are cable stayed you know this this is exactly if, if you were to look at one of these, it looks almost identical to one of those big sprinkler lines. I mean, those are super efficient. It's just a way to hold up that water and with the canted line. And, and we used exactly the same technology here <coughs> with all, you know, custom castings from Pfeiffer and things like that that you wouldn't see in your um, potato farm. But it's the same idea. <coughs> here they are. You can see the tricord trusses through the middle and then cable stayed out here as well. Actually, these are um, tapered rods. So I kind of went a little bit long, I'm sorry, um, but I would love to take a few questions if people have, have questions. I, I start going, I can't stop, my apologies. A question. Do you have to mechanically cool like in the bullet foundation in your climate? Uh, we don't. Um, the, well, uh, mechanical cooling as in air, no. We do have radiant cooling. So we can take the whatever water, uh, the water temperature that's coming out of our geothermal, we'll run that through the slab. We'll get a little bit of cooling through that. But we're just designing the building to uh, a higher set point. So instead of hitting like 70, 75, there may be days in, in the building, a couple days a year where it might get up to 80. But as long as we've got air movement, we've got ce ceiling fans that can turn on during those times and operable windows that uh, we can get away with it. 
It's tough though. We've got uh, a lot of clients that we try to go through this whole exercise of natural ventilation. And you get to the end and they decide that they can't live with two or three days a year at that 78 or 80 degrees, which really isn't that bad. In the building too, did um, you got like almost, or maybe more than 60 feet of building there which would be 60 feet ahead pressure on that water going out of the cistern. Did you look at doing hydro generation? Yeah, we actually were, we, we ran numbers on that and the, the, the payback was like 500 years or something like that, yeah. <laughs> but you know, you're not the first person to ask that question, believe me. A lot of people uh, ask that and we, we couldn't, uh, you can't say no, you've got to prove it out. And so our engineers actually took a, took a hard look at it and just didn't pencil out. Same with, with wind power. People are saying, why don't you put some wind you know, machines on the roof? And the payback is just not there. Um, you need really steady wind uh, for those small fans to work. You, know, you see them around on, on office buildings, but it's kind of a, almost like a, a, a gimmick. You know? it, they work in these big wind farms really, really well, not so well on these smaller buildings. You know. Could you talk a little bit about the energy modeling process um, with the Bullet Foundation, maybe with the, the previous project you just showed? Like, who does it? How often do you meet with them? Is it in-house, out-of-house, that kind of stuff? Yeah, uh, boy, it's so, it's so iterative in terms of how many... We, we were meeting with our mechanical engineers on both of these projects on a weekly basis, all the way through design. From the minute we sat down and started even thinking about the project, we had our mechanical engineer at the table. Um, the Bullet project really grew out of a conversation with our electrical engineer that night after our first workshop, sitting down with the role of Trace. And after one day of talking about the project with the client, we knew that the PV array was going to drive this thing. And so everything followed from that discussion with the electrical. On the mechanical side, um, it's just constant. In the early phases of design, weekly, and then as you move further into it, then it's not, not as often because you've made all the big decisions. But they come back, um, oh, two or three times during the process with, with real, you know, full-blown energy models. And then they get tweaked a little bit, you know, run it again. Yeah. What is your role on these projects, and who else have you got, and what are they doing? Uh, well, um, Bullet, I'll, I'll use that as an example. Um, I was the lead designer through the like, schematic design phase, and we had a young, um, one of our associates, Brian Court, who's one of our, our uh, kind of design architects and has a lot of talent. He was kind of right there with me. About that time is when we, we um, got this big San Ysidro project, and it was just, honestly, I. We were just burning through fees so, so it, at such a crazy rate that I started backing off and Brian started taking over. So he has run with it and he has really been the leader of that project over the last year and a half. Um, then we have a principal who is full-time just managing the project, managing a huge team of consultants. And by the time we got to CDs, we had probably four other people working on it, doing construction documents. Everything's in Revit. And now that we're under construction, we have one person full time and a little bit of help from a couple of other people. So we're probably about 1.5 FTE on construction, which is pretty high for just a, a spec office building. But this one's so intricate with, you know, so many things that we have to have to track in terms of materials that you just have to do it. And then on the San Ysidro project, totally different. I mean, that's huge scale, but I was um, lead designer through the whole thing. In this case, right through CDs, I was involved very heavily. Once we hit CA, then we've got three people full-time CA and uh, two or three people other part-time. We probably have maybe the equivalent of five FTE on construction administration on that one because that's pretty intense. But our, our uh, construction document team on that one at one time was about a dozen people. It was a very abbreviated schedule and a huge project. First phase was 160 million. So it was a big effort. Maybe the last question I get to ask. Um, have you 
done, or are you going to do any integrated project delivery? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we just interviewed for a project down in San Diego. Um, we opened an office down there for a number of reasons, but we interviewed for a project that is using uh, IPD. And we're really excited. We haven't heard yet. We're just crossing our fingers that uh, we interviewed and had a great interview. And I, I just can't wait to try it. We've been uh, studying it and learning as much as we can about it and talking to s certain contractors who we'd want to try it with. You know, you have to be careful about who you, who you match up with. But um, we definitely see that as the wave of the future. And we're excited to give it a try. You know, to have some skin in the game, we're willing to do it as long as everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome.